Hello ladies, my name is Missy Branch and I serve here as the Assistant Dean of Students to Women and the Director of Graduate Life. I am so excited for Women's Emphasis Week and for all that we get to do to shower you with love and to remind you whose you are in the kingdom. One of the incredible gifts we have today for you all is I get the opportunity to interview a young woman who has given her entire life to Jesus. And before, I don't even want to spoil it, I just want to give her the mic. She's an incredible woman. Her name is Katie Davis Majors. Katie, please introduce yourself and tell us a little about yourself. Thanks, Missy. I'm so excited to be with you guys today. Um, like Missy said, I'm Katie. I have lived in Uganda as a missionary for the last 13 years. I met my husband there. We adopted our 13 children there. I actually started the adoption process with them before I married him. Um, now we have two additional babies. So we have 15 mm. children, although now some of them are adults and, and aren't even children anymore. Um, and we run a ministry there called Amazi Mom Ministries that uh, does discipleship of young people as well as schooling and nutritional support and medical care. And so I'm just excited to be here today. I want to tell you a little bit of my story. I want to encourage you a little bit in the word. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to kind of go through my story with you. Yes, jump in. We're excited to hear it, Katie. Thanks. I thought I was courageous once. You know, at 18 years old, I decided to move across the ocean to a village in East Africa with a suitcase full of crayons and construction paper. <laughs> and my heart just determined that I was going to change the world with the gospel. I was bright eyed and determined, full of naive optimism that I had labeled hope and a somewhat silly boldness that I think all 18 year olds might have <laughs> that, I, that I thought was bravery. Um, and, you know, I, I laugh and shake my head a bit at the spirited young girl I once was, but really, I also admire her willingness to just go, just do, just love. That teenage girl didn't overanalyze or overthink when the spirit nudged her. She just leapt. That teenage girl didn't wait for permission or wonder about whether she could do it or she should do it or what other people might think if she she did it. I just went for it. Mm -hmm. And I cannot deny that God used that willingness, even in my naivety, even when I didn't know exactly what I was doing. And it is just really, it's kind of astounding to me that that was 13 years ago. Now, I don't even feel old enough <laughs> to say that I've been living somewhere 13 years. Wow. But Slowly and quietly, Jesus has just replaced my optimism with a true hope, a hope that has grown out of being tested and tried by fire. It's not a hope that looks and waits for just a good outcome. It's a hope that clings only to Jesus, regardless of the situation or the end result. It is a desperation, a choice, a willful determination to choose courage and choose hope. Even when my situation doesn't seem hopeful, even when the outcome doesn't seem optimistic, it is a courage I think that more closely resembles true courage, a faith that can only be found in Jesus. And you know, as I, as I think about telling my story and thinking back, I just, I didn't know it then when I packed my bags and I boarded that long plane full of answers and excitement and my big desire to change the world, I just didn't realize how many answers I really didn't have. So I showed up that first day in Uganda to teach kindergarten, being told that I would have a classroom of around 30 students. And I had packed and prepared for 30 students with all the enthusiasm in the world and instead of teaching 30 students, I was stuck in an old barn in the back of the orphanage complex and 150 little pairs of eyes <laughs> stared back at me. Wow. And the task I was assigned to teach them English. So of course, I had no idea where to begin. I grabbed a ball and I held it up 
and I would say to them, this, this is a ball. And they would all say back to me, this is a ball <laughs> with their eager, zealous little faces and their big smiles. But it wasn't long before I noticed that many of the children would come to school hungry with distended bellies from malnutrition and the life just drifting from their eyes. They would, they would look so exhausted, they would fall asleep right on the tables in class. And, and I would panic and scramble, oh, we have to feed these children. And then I would notice children coming to school with fevers, dirty, and sick. And I would beg my supervisor, please, we have to get these children some medicine. And I would see the hopelessness, you know, just the discouragement of living every day in such immense poverty, juxtaposed to the beauty of their little faces and the way innocent children had stopped smiling. And I would just cry out to the Lord. We have to give these people hope. We have to teach them about Jesus. And I accomplished what the Lord or what the world would say was a lot in those first years of ministry. I, I started paying for more and more kids to come to the school. I started paying them for them to have um, good nutritious meals and for them to be able to get medical care when they needed it. I ran hard and fast for the Lord. And as I did so, my faith was increased. But also the deep realization came that, you know, he didn't need me. I was the one who needed him. I believed and I trusted him and he really did bless me by allowing some incredible things to happen early on in my ministry. At, at that time, you know, I was, I was so determined to work for him and to do things for him. And I just didn't realize the beauty that would find me in a life poured out before him. I didn't know the joy of calling little one's daughter and pressing into him to learn what courage really meant because motherhood, that takes some courage. I didn't know the exhilaration of, the, of true and undefiled worship in a sea of people who didn't speak the same language but worshiped the same God, the thrill of witnessing a life changed due to just basic and simple provision of such things like medical care and nutritional assistance. But as good as it was, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't always easy. I didn't know the pain that awaited me on the other side of the ocean, on the other side of my own humility where I would recognize just how little I really had to offer. I didn't know that I would sometimes carry the responsibility of looking into a mother's face and telling her that her child wasn't going to live this time. I didn't know that I would forge deep friendships with people imprisoned by addiction that I couldn't really help them fight no matter how hard I tried. I didn't know that I would provide care for months at a time for people living with HIV, desperately begging God to spare their lives, only to later find myself holding their hands as they slipped into eternity with him on the other side. <clears throat> I didn't know the loneliness that would come from living life on mission, sometimes seemingly all alone. I would come home from a long day of teaching and have absolutely no one to share with who could relate to my experience. My Ugandan host family was wonderful. They were amazing to me, but this was their day-to-day -day normal life, their home culture. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't relate to my experience. Months later, once I found my own home and had daughters that I had just started the adoption journey with, I would put them to bed and just sit in the silence and let the tears fall as I realized just how utterly unequipped I was to meet all the constant needs around me. But the best and biggest thing that I didn't know, that I didn't know that in the middle of pain, 
and grief and loss, I would experience a joy and a peace that so far surpassed human understanding. The Lord would take the darkest, the most difficult places of my life and make them the places where I knew him more intimately than I had ever imagined that I could. In the middle of a hurricane that surrounded me, I would experience a true comfort so deep, so real, that it just couldn't be denied. It was Jesus. He was near. In the middle of my inadequacy, my fear, my loneliness, the Lord wooed my heart. He drew me to himself and he spoke his love over me in a way I hadn't yet known. In the absence of friends and family, he really was all that I had to lean on. And I look back at that season that I sometimes thought I might not survive. And it is such a cherished gift to my heart. When God didn't give me the answer to prayers that I wanted, he gave me something else. He gave me himself and that was better. And this is what gives me courage. Courage is stepping into the hard thing that God is calling you to and believing that God will meet you there even when you can't see him yet, believing that you will know him more and he will be enough. And you know, you might hear all this and your life might seem pretty different than mine, but I bet in a lot of ways, it is so very similar. Yes, I'm a missionary living in a foreign country, but I don't run my ministry by myself. I work with this incredible team of people who run the ministry. And mostly I am just a stay at home mom. I usually feel like my number one profession is to fold the laundry and people and help people with homework, man, especially this last year, distance learning and negotiate sibling rivalries between 15 children, most of whom are teenage girls. Oh my God. Over the last. <laughs> <laughs> Over the last many years, God has often reinforced for me that in this season, my most important ministry is with my own children and my own family within the walls of our home. You know, I've asked myself a lot over the last 13 years, what is courage? And I've asked this question because at times I've had to really dig deep and I've needed courage to serve the people around me do the big things that I feel like God is asking me. And at times I've had to dig deep just to find courage to keep faithfully pursuing the seemingly mundane everyday tasks of being a mom and believing that the Lord is still using my life for his glory, even when I'm mostly just inside the four walls of my own home. <clears throat> even when his calling to me doesn't feel big or grand or on display in the eyes of the world. And I'm realizing that our unseen faithfulness in the small everyday tasks is often what requires the most courage of all. I've been thinking a lot over the last few years about Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. I can hardly ever read this story without weeping. Yeah. And I just, I really wanted to share an encouragement with you all from this story today. You know, Genesis starts by saying that God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Scripture says that early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. Can you imagine? <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any argument here. He just loaded up his donkey. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm certainly not this quick to respond when God asks something of me. And especially not if he was asking for my kid. I just, I can't imagine the pain, the confusion of Abraham as he loads up his donkey with the firewood. 
as he treks up that pebbly mountain with his beloved son walking beside him. This is the son whom he prayed for. This is the son that God himself promised to him to make him a great nation. He had promised an everlasting covenant to this son and his descendants. And now, was he going to take him away? And Abraham, faithfully, courageously, he loads up that donkey and climbs up the mountain. I don't know about you. Have you been there? I have. Just looking at my own plans, the things that you thought God had promised you and just wondering, why, Lord? How? Why this way? And I wish that I could say that I always had this kind of blind and crazy trust, this resolute courage of Abraham. I envision Isaac plodding along next to his firewood with next to his father, excuse me, with the firewood on his back. And, and Genesis says that Abraham carried the knife and the fire. And I wonder if his hands just trembled with the unknown, with the weight of the task that the Lord had given him. Isaac spoke up to his father and he said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. Father, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Who can never read it without <laughs> crying. I have read this a million times. I, whew, I just cannot get over Abraham's certainty, this bold claim, this un wavering faith. He says it before he can see any proof of it. God will provide the lamb and he is sure. And I just ask myself, do I believe this? That whatever the mountain is, no matter how steep, no matter how seemingly hopeless, though the pebbles slip under my feet as I trudge onward, God will provide that no matter what I've been asked to sacrifice, God will provide. God will provide the strength. God will provide the grace. God will provide the way. Because God provides Jesus. And that's courage, isn't it? To look up at our mountains, whatever they are, and trust him and proclaim that God will be enough because he will provide himself. So go back to our story. Abraham builds his altar and he piles it with the wood. He binds his son there and reaches out his hand to slay him. His trust in God to provide a way out is unimaginable. And just as he lifts his hand, he hears a voice from heaven. That same voice says the same thing. Abraham calls his name and instructs him to lay aside his knife. Scripture says, and Abraham looked, and there in the thicket he saw a ram. And sometimes we can feel like the one carrying the knife, climbing the mountain with our faces set against the wind and wandering all the long way. Why God would call us to this? Why now? How he could ask this thing of us? And I just wanted to encourage you today. I wanted to ask you today, do you have a Mount Moriah? Is there something in your church, your ministry, your family, or your home life, and you feel like you've hit a wall? It's just a climb so steep and you're exhausted and you aren't even sure you want to do this thing you're called to anymore. Or maybe it's, it's a relationship with your spouse or your children or one of your closest friends. Maybe 
that's a relationship you're waiting on, longing for. And it can be lonely on the mountain road, trying to be faithful to what God is asking of you. But I think maybe what God is after most is our surrender. Just laying down our lives and our plans and opening our hands to his. Could it be that he doesn't want our leadership skills or our organizations or our big plans or our good works as much as he wants us? Just us. Over the years, God faithfully brought me out of my lonely, isolated season and into a season where my ministry grew and was booming, supporting hundreds of children and operating schools and all kinds of other amazing programs. And then God put it on my heart to really step back from ministry, to let other people lead the way and just focus on being a stay-at-home mom with my kids. I went from daily watching people's lives transformed in these big ways by God's provision to chopping vegetables and, and doing Zoom calls <laughs> um, and learning how to do algebra so I can help with homework. I've, I've gone from what the world might consider a big ministry and God has taught me to be faithful in the small everyday ministry of shepherding my people to him. And through all of it, he has been faithful to meet me and give me the courage, the hope, and the perseverance that I need for this season. And it makes me think that maybe the greatest courage we can have is to lay it all down, to look up the mountain and tremble with fear, but don't let the fear stop you. Do it anyway, knowing that God's way is better and that ultimately he will provide the very best, his son, the sacrificial lamb. We risk relationship with people that are easy to love and with people that are not easy to love. With the critical person who always has hard things to say and the gentle person who is always grateful. With the addict who has relapsed once again. With the worship leader who invites us to praise. With the child that pushes our buttons and with the best friend that loyally collects our tears. No matter who it is or what God is up to, no matter what your ministry is in your life right now, big or small, we practice the courage that it takes to lean in and love. And most importantly, we practice this courage that it takes to have hope, this hope of Abraham, the hope that no matter what, even when we do not know what the outcome will be, God will give us a ram in the thicket because he will give us himself. Wow, that is beautiful. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing that. There's so many thoughts I have just from your story and from the testimony that you shared. One thing that comes to mind, Katie, is Courage, just how huge a part of your journey courage has been and is. And my question for you is, do you see, well, let me reword it. I, I do see, and I would love to hear how you see. I do see how fear is of, often a, a great motivator for courage, how often the things that we're afraid of is always underlying in our courageous steps forward, right? When I think of you getting on a plane as a teenager, I can't imagine there was no fear, but you did it courageously. And when I think of Abraham's story and even Isaac laying on an altar, <laughs> there has to be fear, yeah. um, but then still courageous. So could you just ex share with us a little bit about how the fear of certain things was kind of a motivator for you? Sure, yes. I mean, there was certainly, when I moved, I had been to Uganda for, for three weeks on a short-term trip. And that's when I decided to commit to move here and teach for a year with a, um, a Ugandan pastor uh, who I had met on my first trip. And there was certainly just a lot of fear of the unknown, especially to go and live um, in this family's home, a completely different culture. You know, everything's different. The family 
didn't speak a ton of English, didn't eat similar foods, you know, certainly um, the fear of discomfort was a big one. And I would say uh, when I was younger, I was kind of an adventurer. And so I was excited to try something <laughs> new and, and not, not totally afraid. I think when fear crept in more was after I was about halfway through my commitment. Mm -hmm. I, I had committed a year and I was about six months in. And I remember the fear of loneliness mm -hmm. um, as I felt that there was nobody who could totally understand me. Mm -hmm. The family that I lived with and the new Ugandan friends I was making were lovely. Um, and yet they didn't share my life experience. Mm -hmm. And so there were things that we would talk about that they couldn't fully understand. But as I would call people back at home in the United States, they certainly didn't understand my experiences and would listen to my stories, but really couldn't relate. And so um, that was really when the fear hit me of nobody's ever going to get it. Mm. I am going to be lonely forever. Um, wow. And like I said, I, I look, I mean, I'm married now. So that loneliness is, is, quite, um, I don't feel it quite as much, but I, I look back at that season and realize just how much God used that loneliness and that solitude uh, to teach me about himself. Wow. Thank you so much. Wow. So let's go back. How did you, as a teenager, learn about international missions? What motivated you to want to go all the way to Uganda? Your first trip was that your first missions trip? And how did you wind up all the way in Africa? <laughs> yeah, so my family is is very service oriented. And so I grew up um, doing all kinds of different service things that were available through our church, going on little mission trips um, around the United States, serving in different capacities at homeless shelters and, and just always really loved serving people. And I don't have a specific reason that we went to Uganda. I mean, I asked my mom if over Christmas break of my senior year, she would go with me on wow. an international wow. service trip. And we got online and we started Googling places where you could internationally volunteer. And an orphanage in Uganda was just the first to write back to us. And they were very consistent to email back and forth and very reassuring of my mom that it would be safe. And so um, we packed up and went wow. to Uganda. And I just, I pretty immediately fell in love with the people and the country and the landscape. And when I, when I met this pastor at at the other orphanage who was trying to start this small kindergarten program, unbeknownst to me in his barn, um, he, he said, please, you know, do you want to come back and help out? And I said, well, sure. Wow. Okay. Shout out to mom. Okay. Mom went mom. with you yes. to Uganda. Yes. She sounds very awesome. She's very awesome. So, okay, you and mom go on this trip and he asks you, do you want to come back? And you say, okay, yeah, I'll come back. I'll commit for a year. How did your parents deal with that? The idea that you would go back and stay for a longer term. And then what was their reaction when you said, I'm not coming back? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think they were fearful to send me for a year. So then my dad actually flew with me the second time mm -hmm. because he said no way my daughter's living in a place for a year that I haven't seen mm -hmm. so he came to check it out and Good I day. think he almost made me get back on the plane with him um I, I think he was very brave <laughs> and it was mm -hmm. very challenging for him to leave me there um so they were supportive mm -hmm. but they were fearful yeah and I think I think they were fearful that I would stay I think they could see that in me. They knew my heart for people. They knew how much I loved service. I think they could see how happy I was there kind of in my element. And I think they were fearful that I would stay. And they, they really wanted me to come back and go to college because, you know, of course they felt like that would set me up for the best future. Um, so they sacrificed a lot and they laid down a lot and um, had to overcome a lot of fears uh, to allow me to just continue to be there, but they were always, um, they were always still very encouraging and supportive, even when 
they were worried for my future. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've had the opportunity to watch several of your interviews, and one of the things that I have heard you say or even describe is the feeling of community that is natural there in Uganda. And coming from America, where obviously we have much more resource, but not necessarily the same sense of community and commitment to each other, what are some of the things that you've learned from the Ugandan community or the Ugandan culture and way of life that you wish was a part of just the world or over here? That's a great question. Yes, um, Ugandans are so good at community. They're so good at hospitality. Mm -hmm. Early on in my time there, I would walk my students home from school. We all lived in this little village and every student I took home, um, someone would go to get me a chair or a bench or a mat to sit on. They would go find any food they had. And I mean, these are people who don't have much food. They don't have the luxury of sharing it with me. Um, it would get anything they had to come and give it to me and serve me. And it's very much just this open door policy. Mm -hmm. If a neighbor comes over, you stop what you're doing and you sit with your neighbor mm -hmm. and you hear about their day. And a lot of life happens outside, you know, because everyone lives in these really small kind of one room houses. And so you wash your clothes outside in a bucket of water, you bathe your babies outside, you do your cooking outside. So the smoke isn't in your house. And so mm -hmm. as you do all your daily activities outside, of course, you're interacting with your neighbors. That's and um, it's just this beautiful picture. People take care of each other's kids. People eat together. People share what they have with each other. If one person doesn't have enough, you know, the neighbor could cover for them. Um, and so I just, I found this so beautiful and also like a little disruptive to be honest. <laughs> yes. It took me a little while to get used to this because people would just then come over to my place and the expectation was, hey, come on in. I'm yep. going to stop what I'm doing and sit with you. And sometimes I felt like, well, I don't want to do that right now. Right. I had something right. else that I was going to do. Um, and not that we should never have any plans, but what a beautiful thing to value relationship over tasks. And so that is something I have now been saying to myself for years and years and years is people over projects, Katie, people over projects. You can sweep the house later. You can get that paperwork done later. You can answer those emails later. Here's a person. Um, and really like, that's such a picture of the gospel and of mm -hmm. Jesus's life. How many times was Jesus trying to go away to a quiet place and the, you know, the crowd came and found him on the other side, you know? And yes. I'm like, no crowd, I don't have time for you right now. But Jesus, he stopped mm -hmm. and he talked with those people and he had compassion on those people. And so um, I just, I feel like I still have a lot to learn. I feel like a Western culture has a lot to learn mm -hmm. just from um, the ability to be interruptible and yeah. hospitality to invite people into our homes when our homes aren't clean, when our homes aren't perfect, when we don't yes. have the brand prepared, but to just let people come in and see us as we really are. And relationships deepen so much quicker this way. Mm. It's so beautiful. Just that idea, uh, that phrase that you used, people over projects. I do think that we've gotten so into our homes need to look perfect before people can come in and everything needs to be done before people can come in that actually the house becomes more of a priority than the people who are there. So I think that's beautiful. But speaking of bringing people into your home, so part of your story is that at 21, you started adopting children. <laughs> I do know, I don't, I can't think, of, I am the mom of a couple of early 20 year olds and I can't imagine them being moms or a, a mom and a dad. And um, so my question for you is, how did you as someone 21 really feel the sense that I can do this? I have what it takes to be these children's mom. You know, I'm not sure that I had that much of a confident sense. I love that. I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> I, I don't know that there was that moment of I yes. can do this, but there was the need. Um, 
so my first three girls, they were children that I was already in relationship with. And when their grandmother passed away and she was their last living caregiver, I actually just offered for them to come and live with me for a time mm-hmm. while we searched out some other family members to care for them. Um, and over the course of several months, it became really apparent that they're just wasn't really anywhere for them to go. And so we started the foster care process. In Uganda, you have to foster a child for three years before you can legalize the adoption. And so I didn't immediately know that I would legally and finally adopt them, but I did immediately start fostering them. And immediately when I began fostering them, they started calling me mom. Um, That was their own choice. They wanted to call somebody mom. And I felt... um, I felt so honored that they would that they would view me in that way um, and that they longed for a caretaker in that way. Now, I yeah, like I said, I don't think I thought to myself, yeah, I am fully equipped to be a mom. But I felt like, okay, Lord, these children need a caretaker. I have, I mean, I have adequate resources mm-hmm. to care for them. And you'll teach me how to do it. And um, it was not perfect. And we both learned, we all learned a lot and we grew a lot together. And a couple months later, a similar um, situation happened with, so my girls are five, they're five sibling sets. And that's how they were so many so fast is because it was really on my heart to not separate siblings who had gone through, um, I mean, you have to have a pretty significant and difficult life event happen to you yes, in order yes. to need to go live with someone else. And I didn't want to separate siblings. And so um, slowly over time, that continued to happen. <laughs> um, and, and it was just a willingness with all of them to say, okay, you can live here with us for a time until we figure out what's next. And we've had many foster children over the years who have really just lived with us for a season and and gone back to a family member. Um, We now have lots and lots of local families on call who are also willing to foster. And so 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 we haven't had a new foster child in a long time because we've always been able to place them with, um, with a Ugandan family who is interested and and that's been really beautiful and really encouraging but uh yeah that's that's how i got my girls and um slowly over time as they didn't have caregivers stepping up to take care of them um once i got married my husband and i finalized those adoptions and how did you and your husband meet is he from the united states excuse me he is from the united states okay. enough he is from about 20 minutes um, he's about 20 minutes from where I grew up. Wow. Never knew each other. He moved to Uganda in 2010. Um, he was working at first with a special needs children's home Mm. and he had come just on a short term volunteer trip there and felt like the Lord really opened his eyes to the fact that in the town where we were living, there were a lot of ministries, mine included Mm -hmm. geared toward, um, women and children empowering women and children. And and there were not a lot of ministries geared toward raising up men. And so he, he came back to the States for a little bit, fundraised a bit, and then came back to Uganda permanently to disciple men. And that's always been his heart, just um, small group Bible studies, discipling men. And we were part of the same small group for a long time. He became just friends with our family, friends with our girls, would hang out with them and teach him to ride bikes and kick around a soccer ball with them in the back. And so he was really, um, he was really a great uh, community member that we knew and a friend of our family for many years before we started dating. And how did that transition go from great family friend, good guy to be around who helps me ride a bike to this is about to be your dad. How did that go? There, it was a mixed, it was a mixed bag. We mm-hmm. had a lot of excitement. We had a lot of fear. We had mm-hmm. a lot of nervousness. Um, yeah, there were a lot, there were a lot of emotions that we were working through. Uh, but I think, I mean, I do think it was helpful that it was, you know, it was somebody that, that they had known for a yes. long time. And, yes. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. We've all grown. We've been married six years now, and and it just, 
it's hard for me to remember a time when he wasn't dad and we weren't married, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, it's just the Lord's provision for sure. Sometimes I can't, sometimes I can't believe that God did that for me. And sometimes I can't believe that he married me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as I tell the story out loud, I just think the Lord. Yeah. So Lord. you, you and your husband have added two more biological children to that's the, right. to the crew, right? That's, that's right. And they're both little boys, which is just a sweet. Oh, wow. So it's gift. 13 girls and two boys? 13 girls and two little boys I love it. at the end. And they are the most doted on sweet yes. little guys. Yes. Oh, how old are they now? Two and four. Wow. They have a lot of mamas, right? <laughs> yes. they do. Yes. Can you talk about the actual ministry? I know that you went there and you started off with, I would love to see uh, children being able to go to school while living in their homes. And yeah. then that sort of expanded. So you were able to send some kids to school and help families. And then that kind of expanded into a, its own ministry. Tell us about that ministry. Yeah. So when I moved to Uganda, I was working and living at an orphanage and they had their little school that they were starting where kids from the community would come to school. But there were also about 120 children living on the orphanage property. Wow. And it was not a great situation. There were not a ton of staff. It was very underfunded. They weren't getting the food and the care that they needed. And I just, I think coming from a Western mindset, I had really believed that if a child lived in an orphanage, probably their parents were dead. But as I would talk to these kids, they would speak about their parents or their grandparents or their aunts and uncles. And they would, they would go visit them sometimes on wow. weekends or on breaks. They would be able to go see them. Some of them were within walking distance of the orphanage. And so I just started asking a lot of questions. Why, why do these kids live here? Um, and unanimously, it was that school is not typically free in Uganda and the cost of school is more than most families can afford. And then sometimes a family could afford maybe for one or two of their children to go to school, but, but usually never for all of their children to go to school because a lot of families are big with five, six, seven mm -hmm. kids. Um, and so a lot of these kids were just at the orphanage because their parents couldn't afford them. But also, as I got to learn more about Ugandan culture, like I mentioned, I saw that it was a very communal culture and that even when a child's parents were dead, so often a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or even just a neighbor or a friend of the parent would be willing to step up and care for the children. So not to make a generalization, of course, there are always exceptions to the right. rule, but on a whole, I saw that people were willing to take care of their children. They weren't sending them away because they didn't want them. They were sending them away because they felt that education was going to give them a better life. And the kids who lived in the orphanage, their education was always paid for by the orphanage. So as I was moving around and walking my students home, you know, I would see children who weren't in school, but I would also hear stories of well, you know, this grandmother is about to send her kids to the orphanage because she can't afford the school or, or something like that. And so I started with just two. There were twin girls and they were scheduled to be sent to the orphanage, but they were living comfortably in their grandmother's house and their grandmother loved them, but they were of school age and she knew she wasn't going to be able to pay the schooling. And so she was trying to get them a space um, at the institution. And I just said like, well, could I like... If I call someone, you know, and it costs between 30 and $50 a year to send wow. this kid to school. So if I call someone and can get you that money, um, could I, could I just send them to school and would you want to keep them? And she said, of course, you know, she was so grateful. And so that was two kids. And then there were four. And within about a year, we had 100 children who I just through word of mouth, you know, calling home to my parents, calling friends, you know, hey, if you don't go out to eat this weekend, you can send a kid to school here. You know, people wanted to do it. And so um, people would just send me a little bit of money and I was able to put these children in school. And then um, as we became a bigger group, I started meeting with them 
on Saturday for Bible studies um, and getting to know their parents. And just slowly, God just continued to grow and grow and grow that. And, and we had, I had more people wanting to send money to be a part. And I had more families coming to me saying, my children are in need of this service. And so I began to hire some of my friends, <laughs> um, some local friends and some, some neighbors and people who I knew from the community. And today we have 600 students. We um, are kind of the, the backbone the backbone of our organization right now is what we call our mentorship program, where we hire social workers who are each assigned about 20 to 30 children and families, and they, um, they're they the ones discipling them, um, teaching them about Jesus, doing small group Bible studies with both the children and the parents at different times, and then throughout the week, um, we pay for those children to go to school. We we've now started providing some job training for some of the parents because our hope is that um, not just that their children would be educated, but that they too would be able to get themselves to a place where if they wanted to pay for the children, their own children's school fees, they could. Um, and then in 2000, oh my goodness, what year is it? In 2017 or 18, <laughs> 17, did the last year just like blur by Mess and everybody up yes yeah. <laughs> yes we were able to open our own secondary school so that's oh. high school level um we felt like a lot of times in order to get a good education we were having to send our students to boarding schools and then their mentor kind of lost touch with them so we felt like right at that key age of like 13 14 15, yes we were losing the kids were still getting education but we weren't able to really disciple them yes. and shepherd them in the word. And so we, um, we opened our own secondary school where they come and are, um, are educated, but also they're just in an environment where all their teachers and all the staff are desiring to point them to Christ. And then this year we will open our primary school. So wow. going forward, yeah, so going forward, all of the children that we support will also be coming to our schools because we really feel like, um, you know, education is where most kids spend the bulk of their day. Yes. And so in order to really make disciples, we want them to be in an environment that is cultivated for that. And um, we've also just started this year a special needs program so that mm -hmm. children with special needs and different kinds of learning disabilities can come and be included and learn in the mainstream classroom with their peers, but also have access to the therapies um, that they need. Because in Uganda, there's a lot of stigma around special needs. Yeah. Children. You don't even yeah. really see special needs children because they're often kind of hidden away. And so we're really excited to open this program and start kind of changing that narrative for these kids. Katie, there was so much in there. The questions were just popping. One of the things that stood out, one of the things that stood out was the fact that for what we probably easily spend a week in Target or a month in Starbucks, you could pay to educate for a child for a year. Um, that's a really challenging thing to think through that we could be frivolous with something that someone could be so desperate for. Uh, one of the questions is, so for everything that you guys are doing, I mean, you just listed a lot. And my mind is blown, first of all, by God, because he's just incredible that he would take one young lady and help create all this. But tell me about your team. How many people are there helping make all this happen? So we have a team of about 300 staff wow. now. Yeah, and about 85% of them are Ugandans. Wow. And then about 15% of them are um, expats, people from different countries, some from America, um, but we even get applications from Brazil and from China. And um, so we are, you know, we try to bring in, when we bring people over, we try to bring in experts who can really provide training to our Ugandan staff, but it's the Ugandan staff who do most of the work in the homes and in the community, because I, I feel that it's really, really important um, for our Ugandan students to be mentored by our Ugandan staff. And they are amazing. Mm. God has provided the most amazing people for us to work with. I just love our team. They love Jesus and they love the kids. 
That's incredible. Recently, I was studying about Tabitha in the Bible. I don't know if you're familiar with her story, but she spent her, she was known for doing good and forgiving. And um, what's beautiful about her giving is that the type of giving that Tabitha did and the type of give, giving you do really requires you to see the humanity in people, not just look at someone as a donation, but to see the humanity in people. How do you think that that was developed in you? Where did that come from? I think a lot of it came from my parents. I mean, my my mom and my dad, they're just, they're good at loving people. Um, and we grew up uh, in a very wealthy community. Mm -hmm. I did. They were very conscious to always point out to me, hey, not everybody lives like this. And mm -hmm. there are people with real needs. And they, mm -hmm. um, my mom was always very welcoming of people into our home. And so I think, um, I think I learned a lot of that from her. I think I, lot, I learned a lot of it from being in Uganda. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, Ugandans have taught me a lot about what it means to really see people. And another thing that I've just seen over the years to be true time and time again is that you can spend all the money and build all the buildings and do all the projects. But the only time that I have ever truly seen a life change is as a result of a relationship. Mm -hmm. whether that was a relationship that I had with, with a person or whether that was a result of a relationship that one of my staff members had with a person. Relationship, hearing a person, knowing a person, loving a person, that is what changes them. And so I think that is just kind of always at the forefront of my mind that um, you can do lots of good and you mm -hmm. can give lots of money but really what it boils down to is, are you modeling Jesus for the person in front of you? Because that is what makes people want to know him. Wow, that sounds like some marching orders. <laughs> um, I have just, we don't have a lot of time, so just a couple more questions for you. One is, if you could name one of your biggest obstacles that you've had to overcome just through this whole journey, what would it be? And then how would you say you've seen God get, God get glory from that? That's a hard question. <laughs> um, you know, in some ways, this is embarrassing to say, I'll say it anyway. In some ways, one of my biggest obstacles is my own pride. Mm. Um, I, I didn't pre-think through this question, so you're yeah, getting I'm it sorry. off the top. Curveball. Uh, <laughs> no, you're good. I, um, yeah, I, I want to be known for being a good person. Mm. And I want to be known, especially early on in my ministry. I mean, God, God has done um, miraculous work in my heart. I mean, I just, yeah, I, I was thinking the other day, um, a friend of mine, my birthday a couple months ago, a friend of mine said, I love you and God has done a good work in you. And I thought, isn't that the truth? It's beautiful. You know, she didn't say you're an amazing friend or you're an amazing mom or you're an amazing ministry leader, which is what I want. Mm -hmm. I want people to know that I <laughs> am good and amazing and doing nice things. But like the truth of the matter is like, God, God has done a good work in me through me. Yes. But, but in me, the way he has changed my own heart and the way he has softened me and the way he has given me desires that are of him, that is a miracle because I know myself and that <laughs> did not come from myself. Um, and so I think, you know, that's one of the biggest obstacles of being a ministry leader is just mm -hmm. thinking, yeah, I do know how to do this. Yeah. yeah, I am. I am doing good stuff. And I mean, the Lord has just... Um, He's just softened me in so many ways from that. A big one was him just really showing me that uh, as Amazima got really big, it was really, I was going to have to choose, you know, when it was small, I just ran it out of my house. Mm -hmm. Staff stopped by and they were in and out, whatever. There wasn't that much money going out. Um, and I was still home with my kids, but there was a time where it was time to either take a big step back from ministry or, you know, hire some people to help with my kids so that I could still work in ministry all the time. And um, I chose to step back wow. and I chose to be at home with my family. And that was difficult, but I have never one time wished that I didn't um, 
And that's different for everybody. I am sure there are people. We all have our hard challenge. Would have been. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's personal to me. I'm sure there are people for whom the right choice would have been to step more into ministry and, and face the hard thing of leaving their children at home. I think that's really personal, but for me, um, God just really taught me you're valuable to me, even if you're not in the spotlight. You don't have to be out there giving the orders. You don't have to be out there writing books or blogging or, um, you know, I turned off my social media for about a year and yeah, you don't have to have followers. You, you can be, you're still loved by me if you do nothing or if your whole day consists of changing diapers and spelling words and making soup and, and whatever, um, And that has just been his sweet, sweet gift to me. Wow. I think what you've shared just really proves that no matter where we are around the world and what kind of ministry we're actually doing, God can use the obstacles in our lives to humble us, but then also to get glory. And I think that that is the sweetest part of your testimony. Katie, well, two things. One, how can people get in contact with you? How can people give? How can people follow you? Yeah, thank you. So um, our ministry website is amazima.org. That's A-M-A-Z-I-M-A dot org. And so on there are all different kinds of opportunities to give and get involved. I'm also back on social media. So I have Facebook and Instagram. um, And so you can find me there. It's predominantly just uh, Bible studies and encouragements in the word. And so I like to connect with people there as well. I do follow you and you you have some quotes on there that I'm going to snatch. There's some really good ones. Um, And amazima means truth is what you told me, right? right? I think that's beautiful. Well, my last question is how can we as a community here, I love the idea of sisters gathering together, feeling responsible for the care of someone else, one of our sisters. And so how can we as sisters here be praying for you regularly? And then even on the immediate, some immediate things you may have. Oh, thank you. That's, yeah, that's such a gift to me that you would ask that. I think, um, a big one right now is just that, um, my children, my personal children are still able to do some school online, but most of Amazima's students have not been able to go back to school since yes, cool. um, yes. the lockdown. And so our teachers are awesome and they've been making up lesson plans and packets mm-hmm. and sending them out to homes and trying to, you know, safely do um, distribution and things like that. But we would love to have our students back. We just were able to bring about 70 of them who were in the right grade back on campus, but not everybody was is able to come back. And so we would just love prayer that schools would open. Amen. Um, okay. And also just that our, our students would be safe and mm-hmm. healthy and protected mm-hmm. while they are at home. Um, we are anxious to get back. And then, um, yeah, for our family, we have some big, we have some big decisions coming up. Okay. Um, And so if you could just really pray for clarity and discernment and unity among our family um, for for some big stuff that we have coming up, I would so personally appreciate that as well. I would love it. I would love it. Well, I'm going to pray with us really, really quickly, and then we're going to say goodbye. This has been so encouraging. Thank you so much for your time and for the way you are being used and the way you continue to be used. We will continue to follow your story so that we can see what God is doing throughout this time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for Katie and for all that Katie represents, which is more than just her family, Lord God, but a disciple of you, a woman who was willing to give her life, uh, her resources, uh, to lay it down for your glory. Father, stir that in all of us. Show us how to be willing to lay it all down for your glory. Thank you for her story and how unique it is to her. And thank you, Lord God, for how it reminds us that you are moving through your people. Father, we pray for the children in Uganda at Amazama School that you would bring them back, Lord God, that you would allow them to come back safely. And we pray that um, around the world. But Father, specifically that you would be with those children, that you would continue to encourage them, that you would continue to encourage the staff and the teachers and the mentors, Lord God. But that ultimately, that that would be a community that is rocked by the gospel 
and that their lives would be changed for all of eternity. We love you, Lord God, and are grateful for this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow, Katie, thank you again. This was ah, so much thank fun. You so much. It was fun. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to the next time, my friend. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>